The Master and Margarita by Mikhail Bulgakov Translated from the Russian by Mira Ginsburg Who art thou, then? Part of the power which eternally wills evil and eternally works good. Goethe, Faust Book 1 Chapter 1 Never Speak to Strangers at the hour of sunset, on a hot spring day, two citizens appeared in the Patriarch's Ponds Park. One, about forty, in a grey summer suit, was short, plump, dark-haired, and partly bald. He carried his respectable pancake-shaped hat in his hand, and his clean-shaven face was adorned by a pair of supernaturally large eyeglasses in a black frame. The other was a broad-shouldered young man, with a mop of shaggy red hair in a plaid cap pushed well back on his head, a checked cowboy shirt, crumpled white trousers, and black sneakers. The first one was none other than Mikhail Alexandrovich Berlioz, editor of an important literary journal and chairman of the board of one of the largest literary associations in Moscow, known by its initials as Masalit. His young companion was the poet Ivan Nikolaevich Ponerev, who wrote under the pen name of Homeless. When they had reached the shade of the linden trees, which were just turning green, the literary gentleman hurried toward the brightly painted stall with a sign, Beer and Soft Drinks. Oh yes, we must take note of the first strange thing about that dreadful May evening. Not a soul was to be seen around. Not only at the stall, but anywhere, along the entire avenue running parallel to Male Bronne. At that hour, when it no longer seemed possible to breathe, when the sun was tumbling in a dry haze somewhere behind Sadovoya Circle, leaving Moscow scorched and gasping, nobody came to cool off under the lindens to sit down on a bench. The avenue was deserted. Give us some narzan, said Berlioz. We have no Narzan, answered the woman behind the stall in an offended tone. Do you have beer? Homeless inquired in a hoarse voice. They'll bring beer in the evening, said the woman. What do you have? asked Berlioz. Apricot soda, but it's warm, said the woman. All right, let's have that. Let's have it. The apricot soda produced an abundant yellow foam, and the air began to smell of a barber shop. Drinking it down, the writers immediately began to hiccup, paid and settled on a bench facing the pond with their backs to Bronne. And now came the second strange thing, which involved only Berlioz. He suddenly stopped hiccuping. His heart thumped and dropped somewhere for a second, then returned, but with a blunt needle stuck in it. Besides, Berlioz was gripped with fear, unreasonable but so strong that he had the impulse to rush out of the park without a backward glance. He looked around anxiously, unable to understand what had frightened him. He turned pale, mopped his forehead with his handkerchief and thought, What's wrong with me? This never happened before. My heart is playing up. I'm overworked. Perhaps I ought to drop everything and run down to Kislavotsk. At this moment, the fiery air before him condensed and spun itself into a transparent citizen of the strangest appearance, a jockey's cap on a tiny head, a check jacket, much too short for him, and also woven of air. The citizen was seven feet tall, but narrow in the shoulders, incredibly lean, and, if you please, with a jeering expression on his physiognomy. The life which Berlioz had led until that moment had not prepared him for extraordinary phenomena. Turning still paler, he stared with bulging eyes and thought with consternation, This cannot be! But alas, it was. And the elongated citizen that he could see through swayed before his eyes to left and right without touching the ground. Berlioz was so panic-stricken that he closed his eyes, and when he opened them again, he saw that everything was over. The apparition had dissolved, the checkered character had vanished, and with him the needle had slipped out of his heart. What the devil, the editor exclaimed. You know, Ivan, I nearly had a heart stroke just now. There was even a kind of hallucination. 
He tried to smile, but anxiety slow, still flickered in his eyes and his hands trembled. Gradually, however, he recovered his composure, fanned himself with his handkerchief, and saying quite briskly, Well then, he continued the conversation, interrupted by the drinking of the apricot soda. This conversation, as we learned subsequently, was about Jesus Christ. The point is that the editor had commissioned the poet to write a long anti-religious poem for the coming issue of his journal. Ivan Nikolaevich composed the poem, and quickly, too. Unfortunately, the editor was not at all pleased with it. Homeless had portrayed the principal character of his poem, Jesus, in very dark hues. Nevertheless, in the editor's opinion, the poem had to be rewritten. And so the editor was giving the poet something of a lecture on Jesus in order to stress the poet's basic error. It is difficult to say precisely what had tripped up Ivan Nikolaevich, his imaginative powers or complete unfamiliarity with the subject. But his Jesus turned out, well, altogether alive. The Jesus who had existed once upon a time, although invested, it is true, with a full range of negative characteristics. Berlioz, on the other hand, wanted to prove to the poet that the main point was not whether Jesus had been good or bad, but that he had never existed as an individual, and that all the stories about him were mere inventions, simple myths. It must be added that the editor was a well-read man. He skillfully interlarded his speech with references to ancient historians, such as the flame, uh, famed Philo of Alexandria and the brilliantly learned Flavius Josephus, none of whom had ever mentioned the existence of Jesus. Showing his solid erudition, Mikhail Alexandrovich informed the poet, among other things, that the passage of Book 15, Chapter 44, of Tacitus' famous Annals, which speaks of the execution of Jesus, was nothing but a later spurious insertion. The poet, to whom everything the editor said was new, listened to Mikhail Alexandrovich attentively, staring at him with his slightly impudent green eyes and merely hiccuped from time to time, damning the apricot soda under his breath. There is not a single Eastern religion, said Berlioz, where you will not find an immaculate maiden giving birth to a god. And the Christians invented nothing new, but used a similar legend to create their Jesus, who in fact had never existed. And this is what needs to be stressed above all. The editor's high tenor resounded in the deserted avenue, and as he delved deeper and deeper into jungles where only a highly educated man could venture without risking his neck, the poet learned more and more fascinating and useful facts about the Egyptian Osiris, the beneficent god who was the son of sky and earth, and about the Phoenician god Marduk, and about Tammuz, and even about the more obscure god Hutzlipotzli, who had once been worshipped by the Aztecs in Mexico. And just at the moment when Mikhail Alexandrovich was telling the poet how the Aztecs had used dough to make figurines of Huitzilopochtli, the first stroller made an appearance in the avenue. Afterward, when, frankly speaking, it was already too late, various official institutions filed reports describing this man. A comparison of these reports can only cause astonishment. Thus, the first says the man was short, had gold teeth, and limped on the right foot. The second, that the man was of enormous height, had platinum crowns and limped on the left foot. The third states, laconically, that the man had no special distinguishing characteristics. We must discard all these reports as quite worthless. To begin with, the man described did not limp on either foot and was neither short nor enormous in height, but simply tall. As for his teeth, he had platinum crowns on the left side of his mouth and gold ones on the right. He wore an expensive gray suit and foreign shoes of the same color. His gray beret barrette was worn at a jaunty angle over his ear, and under his arm he carried a cane with a black handle in the form of a poodle's head. He appeared to be in his forties. His mouth was somehow twisted. He was smooth-shaven, a brunette. His right eye was black, the left, for some strange reason, green. Black eyebrows, but one higher than the other, in short, a foreigner. Passing the bench where the editor and the poet were sitting, 
The foreigner glanced at them out of the corner of his eye, stopped, and suddenly sat down on the next bench two steps away from the friends. A German, thought Berlioz. An Englishman, thought Homeless. Doesn't he feel too warm in gloves? The foreigner's eyes ran over the tall buildings that formed a square bordering the pond, and it was obvious that he was seeing this place for the first time, and that it interested him. His glance stopped on the upper floors, where the window panes dazzlingly reflected the fragmented sun that was departing from Mikhail Alexandrovich forever, then slid down to where the panes were darkening with evening. He smiled condescendingly, screwed up his eyes, placed his hands on the cane handle, and his chin on his hands. You describe such scenes as the birth of Christ, the Son of God, satirically, and extremely well, Ivan said Berlioz, but the point is that whole strings of sons of God preceded Jesus, the Phoenician Adonis, the Phrygian Attis, the Persian Mithras, and, to make it short, none of them was born, and none existed, including Jesus. Instead of dwelling on the birth of the coming of the Magi, you might uh, show how the preposterous rumors were spread about this coming. Otherwise, as you tell the story, it appears he was really born. Homeless tried to suppress the tormenting hiccups by holding his breath, which made him hiccup still more painfully and loudly. And at the same moment, Berlioz broke off his oration because the foreigner suddenly got up and walked toward the riders. They looked at him with astonishment. Excuse me, please, the man began speaking with a foreign accent, but in correct Russian, for taking the liberty, although we have not met, but the topic of your learned discourse is so interesting that he courteously removed his beret, and the friends had little choice but to raise themselves a little and bow. No, he is more like a Frenchman, thought Berlioz, a Pole, thought Homeless. It must be added that the poet was repelled by the foreigner from his very first words, while Berlioz rather liked him. Well, perhaps it was not so much that he liked him, but how shall I put it, he was intrigued by him, I guess. May I join you? the foreigner asked civilly, and the friends involuntarily moved apart. The foreigner slipped in between them and immediately entered the conversation. If I heard you correctly, you said that Jesus never existed? He asked, turning his green left eye to Berlioz. You heard correctly, Berlioz answered courteously. That was precisely what I said. Ah, how interesting, exclaimed the foreigner. What the devil does he want, Homeless thought, frowning. And did you agree with your friend? inquired the stranger, turning right toward Homeless. One hundred percent, said the poet, who liked fanciful and figurative expressions. Astonishing, exclaimed the uninvited companion. Then, for some strange reason, he threw a furtive glance over his shoulder like a thief, and, hushing his low voice still further, he said, Forgive my importunity, but I understood that, in addition to all else, you don't believe in God either? He opened his eyes wide with mock fright and added, I swear I will not tell anyone. No, we do not believe in God, Berlioz replied, smiling faintly at the tourist fear. But we can speak of it quite openly. The foreigner threw himself back against the bench and asked, his voice rising almost to a squeal with curiosity, You are atheists? Yes, we are atheists, Berlioz answered, smiling, and homeless thought angrily, latched on to us, the foreign goose. Oh, how delightful, cried the amazing foreigner, his head turning back and forth from one writer to the other. In our country, atheism does not surprise anyone, Berlioz said with diplomatic courtesy. Most of our population is intelligent and enlightened, and has long ceased to believe the fairy tales about God. At this point, the foreigner suddenly jumped up and pressed the astonished editor's hand, saying, Permit me to thank you from the bottom of my heart. What do you thank him for? inquired Homeless, blinking. For a most important bit of information, which is of the highest interest to me as a traveler, the foreign eccentric explained, raising his finger significantly. 
the important information had evidently indeed produced a strong impression on the traveller, for his eyes made a frightened round of the buildings as though expecting to see an atheist in every window. No, he's not an Englishman, thought Berlioz, and Homeless thought frowning again. I'd like to know where he picked up his Russian. But permit me to ask you, the foreign guest resumed after a troubled silence, what about the proof of God's existence? As we know, there are exactly five of them. Alas, Berlioz answered with regret, none of these proofs is worth a thing, and humanity has long since scrapped them. You must agree that in the realm of reason there can be no proof of God's existence. Bravo! cried the foreigner. Bravo! These are exactly the words of the restless old Emmanuel on the subject. But curiously enough, he demolished all five arguments and then, as if to mock himself, constructed his own sixth one. Kant's argument, the educated editor countered with a subtle smile, is equally unconvincing. No wonder Schiller said that only slaves could find Kant's reasoning on the subject satisfactory, and Strauss simply laughed at his proof. As Berlioz spoke, he thought to himself, but still, who is he, and why does he speak Russian so well? This Kant ought to be sent to Salavki for three years for such arguments, Ivan Nikolaevich burst out suddenly. Ivan, Berlioz whispered with embarrassment. But the suggestion that Kant be sent to Solovki not only did not shock the foreigner, but pleased him immensely. Exactly, exactly, he cried, and his green left eye turned to Berlioz glittered. That's just the place for him. I told him that day at breakfast, say what you will, professor, but you have thought up something that makes no sense. It may be clever, but it's altogether too abstruse. People will laugh at you. Berlioz gaped at him. At breakfast? Told Kant. What is he babbling about, he wondered. No, continued the stranger, undeterred by the editor's astonishment and addressing the poet. It is impossible to send him to Solovki for the simple reason that he has resided for the past hundred odd years in places considerably more remote than Solovki, and I assure you it is quite impossible to get him out of there. A pity, the belligerent poet responded. Indeed a pity, I say so too. The stranger agreed, his eye flashing. Then he went on. But what troubles me is this. If there is no God, then you might ask, who governs the life of men and generally the entire situation here on earth? Man himself governs it, Homeless angrily hastened to reply to this frankly rather unclear question. Sorry, the stranger responded mildly, but in order to govern... It is, after all, necessary to have a definite plan for at least a fairly decent period of time. Allow me to ask you, then, how man can govern if he cannot plan for even so ridiculously short a span as a thousand years or so, if, in fact, he cannot guarantee his own next day? And really, the stranger turned to Berlioz, imagine yourself, for example, trying to govern, to manage both others and yourself, just getting into the swing of it, when suddenly you develop mm, mm, uh, cancer of the lung. The foreigner smiled sweetly, as though the idea of cancer of the lung gave him intense pleasure. Yes, cancer. He relished the word, closing his eyes like a tomcat, and all your management is done with. You are no longer interested in anyone's destiny but your own. Your relatives begin to lie to you. Sensing the end, you rush to doctors, then to charlatans, or even to fortune tellers, although you know yourself that all are equally useless. And everything ends tragically. He who had but recently believed that he was managing something now lies stretched, motionless, in a wooden box.
and those around him, realizing he is no longer good for anything, incinerate him in the oven. Or it may be even worse. A man may plan to go to Kislavotsk, and the stranger squinted at Berlioz. A trifling undertaking, one might think, but even this is not within his power to accomplish, for he may suddenly, for no known reason, slip and fall under a streetcar. Would you say that he had managed this himself? Would it not be more accurate to think that it was someone else entirely who had disposed of him? And the stranger broke into an odd little laugh. Berlioz listened to the unpleasant story about cancer in the streetcar with close attention, and a vaguely anxious feeling began to stir in him. He's not a foreigner. He's not a foreigner, he thought. A most peculiar individual, but then who can he be? I see you'd like to smoke, the stranger suddenly asked homeless. What brand do you prefer? Why, do you carry different brands? The poet, who had run out of cigarette, asked, scowling. Which do you prefer? The stranger repeated. Well, our brand, Holmes replied crossly. The stranger immediately drew a cigarette case from his pocket and offered it to him. Our brand. Both the editor and the poet were struck by the cigarette case even more by the fact that it contained precisely our brand. It was huge, made of red gold, and its lid, as it was being opened, flashed with the blue and white fire of a diamond triangle. The literary gentleman had different thoughts. Berlioz said to himself, No, he's not a foreigner. And Homeless thought, The devil have you ever? The poet and the owner of the cigarette case lighted up while Berlioz, a non-smoker, declined. My counter-argument, decided Berlioz, must be, Yes, man is mortal, no one questions that, but the point is, but before he had time to utter the words, the foreigner resumed, yes, man is mortal, but this is not the worst of it. What is bad is that he sometimes dies suddenly. That's the trouble. And generally, he can never say what he will do that very same evening. What an absurd way of posing the problem, Berlioz thought, and retorted, Well, this is an exaggeration. I know more or less definitely what to expect this evening. Of course, if a brick should drop on my head on Bronne... A brick? The stranger interrupted with a magisterial air. Will never drop on anyone's head to start at the blue. And specifically, I can assure you that you are in no danger of it. You shall die another death. Do you happen to know which precisely? Berlioz inquired with entirely natural irony, allowing himself to be drawn into a truly preposterous conversation. And if so, would you mind telling me? Willingly, responded the stranger. He looked Berlioz up and down as though measuring him for a new suit, and muttered through his teeth something that sounded like one, two, Mercury in a second house, the moon is gone, six, misfortune, evening, seven. Then he announced loudly and gaily, your head will be cut off. Homeless stared with wild rage at the presumptuous stranger, and Berlioz asked with a crooked smile, and who precisely will do it? Enemies? Interventionists? No, replied the stranger, a Russian woman, a member of the Young Communist League. Hmm, Berlioz grunted, irritated by the little joke. This, if you will excuse me, is not very likely. I beg your pardon, the foreigner replied, but it is so. Oh, yes, I meant to ask you, what do you expect to do this evening if it is not a secret? It is not a secret. I shall now stop off at home on Sadovia, and later at ten o'clock there will be a meeting of Masalit, at which I will shall be chairman. No, it is impossible the foreigner rejoined firmly. And why? Because, replied the foreigner, squinting up at the sky, where blackbirds darted silently in anticipation of the coolness of the evening. Because Anushka has already bought sunflower oil, and not only bought it, but spilled it too, so that the meeting will not take place.
At this point, as may well be understood, there was silence under the lindens. Forgive me, Berlioz spoke after a pause, glancing at the foreigner who was babbling such nonsense, but uh, what has sunflower oil to do with it, and, and, and who is Anushka? Sunflower oil has nothing to do with anything. Homeless suddenly broke in, evidently deciding to declare war on their uninvited companion. Have you ever, by any chance, been in a hospital for the mentally ill? Ivan, Mikhail Alexandrovich exclaimed in a low voice. But the foreigner was not in the least offended. He burst into gay laughter. Oh, yes, I have. <laughs> Many times, he cried laughing, but fixing the poet with his unsmiling eye. Name a place I have not been to. It is a pity, though, I have never asked any of the professors the meaning of schizophrenia, so that you will have to ask this question yourself, Ivan Nikolaevich. How do you know my name? Why is there anyone who does not know you, Ivan Nikolaevich? The foreigner took from his pocket last night's literary gazette, and Ivan Nikolaevich saw his face in his own verse on the very first page. But this evidence of his fame and popularity which had been such a source of joy to him the day before, now gave the poet no pleasure whatsoever. I'm sorry, he said, and his face darkened. Can you excuse us a moment? I want to say a few words to my friend. Oh, certainly, exclaimed the stranger. It is so pleasant here under the lindens, and I am incidentally in no hurry to go anywhere. Listen, Misha. The poet whispered, drawing Berlioz aside. He's no tourist. He's a spy. He's a Russian emigre who has warmed his way back here. Ask to see his documents before he goes away. You think so? Berlioz whispered with alarm, thinking, he's right. Take my word, the poet hissed into his ear. He's pretending to be a fool so he can get some information. You heard how he speaks Russian, the poet said, watching the stranger out of the corner of his eye lest he escape. Come on, let's stop him before he makes off and the poet drew Berlioz by his hand back to the bench. The stranger was no longer sitting, but standing near the bench. In his hands was a little notebook and a dark gray binding, a thick envelope made of good paper and a calling card. Excuse me for failing to introduce myself in the heat of our argument. Here's my card, my passport, and the invitation to visit Moscow for a consultation. He said impressively, with a penetrating look at the two literary gentlemen. The friends were embarrassed. Damn it, he heard everything, Berlioz thought, and gestured politely to indicate that there was no need to show documents. While the stranger held them out to the editor, the poet had time to catch the word professor, printed on the card in a foreign alphabet, and the first letter of his name, a W. Very pleased, the editor mumbled in confusion, and the foreigner put the documents into his pocket. Thus, relations were restored, and all three sat down on the bench once more. Were you invited to our country as a consultant, professor? asked Berlioz. Yes, as a consultant. Are you German? inquired Homeless. I? asked the professor, and suddenly fell into reverie. Yes, perhaps I am, he said. You speak excellent Russian, remarked Homeless. Oh, I'm generally polyglot. I know a great many languages, replied the professor. And what is your field? asked Berlioz. I'm a specialist in black magic. Now what? flashed through the mind of Mikhail Alexandrovich. And it was in this capacity that you were invited here? he stuttered. Yes, in this capacity, confirmed the professor and explained. They have found in your state library authentic manuscripts by the 10th century necromancer Herbert de Aurillac, and I was asked to decipher them. I am the only specialist in the world. Ah, you're a historian, Berlioz asked respectfully with great relief. I am a historian, confirmed the scholar, and added irrelevantly, there will be a most interesting occurrence at the Patriarch's Ponds this evening. Both the editor and the poet were extremely astonished again. The professor beckoned to them, and when they bent over, he whispered, And keep in mind that Jesus existed. <laughs>
You see, Professor, Berlioz answered with a strained smile, we respect your great erudition, but we ourselves maintain a different view on this question. Oh, there is no need for points of view, replied the strange professor. He simply existed, that is all. But there must be some proof, began Berlioz. There is no need for proof either, answered the professor, and said in a low voice, suddenly without any accent, Everything is very simple. In the early morning of the fourteenth day of the spring month of Nissan, wearing a white cloak with a blood-red lining, and walking with the shuffling gait of a cavalryman.